and good evening. Uh, welcome to Heavens in Conversation and a late opening. Uh, I'm Kostas Sassinopoulos. I'm one part of the Back to Earth curatorial team. The other two, Rebecca and Lucia, are on the edges of this beautiful panel centering Revital Cohen and Tour Van Balen. We are incredibly thrilled to be presenting Heavens, finally. It's been a project in the making for a very long time as part of the Back to Earth project. It's uh, presented in collaboration today with Malevich.io and Svetlana March. Thank you very much for their support and enthusiasm to the project. We want to thank all of you for joining us. We want to thank our um, incredible supporters and our council who is here with us today as well. I won't say too much because I really want us to all dive straight in. Um, welcome, please, if you haven't seen the work, feel free to stay and we're gonna be open here until midnight and I, I give the floor to everyone here. Lucia Peter, do you wanna start? I think I'm gonna start. <laughs> thank you, Costas, and thank you everyone for being with us this evening. Um, as Costas mentioned, this um, work was really uh, born out of the Back to Earth project, which has been running for a couple of years now at the Serpentine. And it's been an opportunity for us to work together across teams with a real variety of different practitioners working in many different ways. And what we went to each of the artists uh, and practitioners with was a proposal. Within your work, within your thinking, how would you uh, respond within your practice to the climate crisis, what kind of work would you make and how and where could we help through the institution to support and present that work and that thinking? And our question was really thinking of all of that in the context of the climate crisis and the climate emergency on Earth. And the most extraordinary response came from Tua Anuevital, um, which has prompted this work and this experience that you're all about to have um, that expands our notion of what our ecosystem and what ecology as a series of networked and interrelationships really is. Um, should it begin and end with the human experience of ecology? Should it begin and end even with Earth? Um, do we reach out further to an interplanetary series of networks? So. To dive in, we really wanted to kick off the conversation by talking through how this work was born. And my first question to the two of you is really, um, what was the starting point? What was the thing that kicked off? Um, we'll get into the context of where you were coming from and the, the wider part of your practice that has fed into the work. But there was a, a specific article that you used, I think, as a starting point for Heavens. Would you talk a bit about that to start? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'll go first. <clears throat> well, thank you, first of all, everyone for coming and having us and making this possible, um, Serpentine and all the wider supporters. Um, so the paper you mentioned is a scientific paper that is written by 20 scientists, uh, and it talks about the cause of the Cambrian explosion and the Cambrian explosion is this event, uh, top of my head, I think 500 million years ago, in which there was this massive increase in biodiversity. Um, and so we know that because people look at fossils. And the paper talks about the cause of the Cambrian explosion uh, and sort of tries to prove that it's extraterrestrial. And specifically then, in the later half of the paper, it goes on to talk about how the squid how, sorry, the octopus is actually a squid infected by DNA from outer space, uh, which arrived to Earth traveling as a virus on a meteorite. Um, and that kind of blew our minds. So after reading this, um, what was so interesting to me was not even whether the scientific theory is true or not. I mean, as an artist, I don't, I don't mind. But um, it was just really inspiring in thinking that our ecosystem is potentially so much vaster than Earth. And um, when thinking that perhaps us and animals and plants around us carry some extraterrestrial DNA was also kind of interesting in light of 
I don't know, recent space race and this kind of escape to space to avoid climate disaster. So there was some kind of interesting parallel there of going from up to down, down to up again. And having massively expanded, you know, beyond, I'd say, well, I think we should come back to boundaries and escape, but um, having massively expanded those, let's say, edges of, of what you were considering, what was it that led you to the, uh, the idea of the octopus as a muse for this work? Because that's, that's a word that you've used to describe the, the let's say, the, the, the origin of many different elements from the structure to then the research strands that you followed um, in order to bring everything together. I guess the kind of very specific example in this paper of the octopus evolving from this extraterrestrial virus from the squid, I thought it was quite interesting if we can co then compare the squid and the octopus, then all the things the octopus can do that the squid cannot are potentially this kind of absolute other. These are the things that came from another planet. And these are kind of these, these things that led the work. But how does it structure it? Like, the th you know, nine brains and three hearts and all of Exactly. I mean, so the octopus, I mean, it's an incredible animal. Um, it's got three hearts, eight or nine brains, depends how you count. It does very incredible things with its skin. It's very expressive through its skin. It works a lot with color, although it is colorblind. Um, it has very extreme and very violent sexual behaviors. It can escape through almost any kind of hole because it has no skeleton at all. It's just a soft tissue. Um, it also has, <coughs> arguably has consciousness. So it, it, it's widely acknowledged that the octopus is very intelligent, intelligent enough to be for example, protected at the same level as primates are when it comes to doing scientific testing on animals. Um, but I think in terms of the structure also, the way it's structured, the making of this work is that um, after teasing out these things that the octopus has that we were really interested in, we sort of went off and spoke to different people about these very specific things. So we spoke to a forensic psychiatrist, um, Stella, um, as Tyler Walden, who, um, who really specializes in extreme kind of sexual behaviors, um, for example, and we spoke to her about these things. We spoke to an escape artist. Um, who is the only escape artist in the UK that does water escapes, so can do the kind of Houdini escape from a tank of water. Um, we spoke to artist and writer James Bridal, who um, argued and thinks a lot about non-human intelligence uh, from the perspective of us as humans having built non-human intelligence, like we first had to build it, i.e. this artificial intelligence, in order to then think about other forms of non-human intelligence that already exist, which is plant intelligence, uh, animal intelligence. Um, Chandra? And then we spoke to Chandra, who is one of the, he's the astrobiologist and one of the main of the 20 scientists who wrote the original paper. Uh, and it was completely mind-blowing to talk to him about astrobiology, about uh, the notion of interplanetary ecology. But we were also really interested in talking to him about what it is like to write a scientific paper with so many brains, um, <laughs> i.e. the octopus having eight to nine brains, so the octopus can think with each of its arms, and it has a central brain. And the first person we spoke to, actually, and we kind of call her patient zero, is a philosopher, Amiya Srinivasan, who's written just so beautifully about the octopus as kind of perhaps an idea. Um, and we wanted to talk to all these people in order to indeed write a piece of text that will be kind of written or thought through by multiple brains, sort of not just, not just a singular one. And then we took all these texts and um, kind of cut them up. The work is also very inspired by uh, William S. Burroughs and his theory that language is a virus from outer space. So we kind of started from that um, practice of cut up and then also kind of a lot of original material emerged and everything was edited in a kind of uh, very loosely structure of, um, of a religious ritual going through two peaks where it's kind of again goes up, goes down to the sea, goes up to the sky and down to the sea again. I wanted to, to ask more a direct question before we 
I think, go back to the, the structure of the film, just on that point about intelligence, because there's a, an adapted quote from James Bridle in the um, text um, that says, intelligence is not inside our heads, intelligence is in the world. And as you say, all of those different brains that have gone into and are evidenced in the, the work. Um, I wondered if you could speak about if that feels like an expansion on the way that the two of you work together normally, or if, it, if it's very, very specific to, to this piece and the, the structure and the multiplicity that you're after in order to kind of ape. That's a mixing of metaphors, if ever I heard one, to ape an octopus. <laughs> Um, I think it probably extends on the way that we work and also perhaps the way that we write anyway. I mean, many years ago, the first time we were commissioned an essay in a catalogue, we were like, okay, how do we do this? And very early on, we decided we're not going to have a, sing a one voice that goes like, we. And instead, we kind of started to break it apart and have his voice and mine, and we kind of jam it together. And then we have all these references and research, and everything becomes... Um, something perhaps less coherent, but a bit more kind of atmospheric. So this was just like a mega expansion of this. But I think you're right in a way that I'd ha I hadn't thought of it like that way to come back with maybe what James was alluding at is that uh, when he spoke about intelligence is not in our head, but it's in the world, intelligence is these relationships. And it, us as humans, we have kind of have the tendency to think a lot more individualistic uh, about consciousness and intelligence and, and he argues that no it's it's exactly in these relationships not within the kind of individual so in many ways the octopus perhaps is is like as an individual already contains these kind of multiplicities of of eight brains and these relationships um, but it does yeah yeah so um I remember when you first started to, uh, well, first of all, thank you for bringing us into this uh, experience of cosmic trans and orgasmic vanishing, as you've described it elsewhere. Um, in, um, when we, so we started to speak about this piece maybe a couple of years ago, and one of the first sentences that uh, began to describe what was at the time just a proposal, really, was looking up to look down, looking down to look backwards or something. Looking something to look something else. <laughs> there were two looking, uh, there were four yeah. lookings, but one of them was looking up to look down. And so the, in, a, in a sense, the installation, the choices of, uh, of installing it in this way are very specific and you had some references that were also very specific. So I wondered if you could just describe those a yeah. little bit. So I think, um, so you're talking more about the structure and the way it's presented rather than the structure over time that Eftal just mentioned. That's right, just exactly. like ending up on your back. Totally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, very early on, I think we, we really knew that we wanted to make, we spoke about it for a while as a film for a planetarium setup. Because when you go to the planetarium, you have a kind of existential experience in which which is very didactic. So we wanted to kind of subvert the didacticness of that experience. But we did want to maybe tap into kind of this sort of existential experience of you're looking at the stars, but the light from the stars takes millions of years to reach us, and by now the stars are dead and we're nothing but cosmic dust. And you know, so and at the same time, it's a very, it's a very specific experience that um, and the reference you, you mentioned is an essay that Walter Benjamin um, wrote. And so he must have seen the very first planetarium built by, by Zeiss, the, the maker of lenses, in the 30s in Berlin, built a planetarium at, at which time that planetariums were these huge optomechanical devices that project with multiple lenses all the stars. It's not like a digital projector we use now. And, and Walter Benjamin writes about about his experience, and he says that all of these optical technologies, first for looking at the stars, telescopes, etc., and later for projecting the stars, they actually only remove us further away from the cosmos, and that the real connection with the cosmos is this pre-modern cosmic trance. So he literally says the word cosmic trance. Um, I guess at which point is me, like as a kid growing up in 90s Belgium, uh, in clubs, I go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Cosmic trance <laughs> is what we want. Um, 
And I think that's where the sort of we wanted it to be a film for the ceiling. There's also something I think when you look at the in a film that is on the ceiling um, that you don't really see so much or don't notice all the other people around you. That you don't look at them, they don't look at you. You're not conscious of anyone looking at you. You can just kind of immerse in the thing, and you perhaps forget your kind of body and your presence. You can just kind of be lost to the work, which I found quite important. Should we say anything else about the structure of the film before? Because I think what you just said, Reptile, again speaks to the borders and boundaries um, idea. Um, but just in terms of the arc of, um, I'm not going to call it a narration, but let's say um, the sequence of very concentrated um, areas and moments within the film, some of which repeat, some of which cycle back, some of which, uh, as you say, peak um, and then recede at the end. Could you say something about how, where that structure came from and how you decided to put those things together in the sequence that you did? So I guess um, the three stages of the work were text and then sound followed the text and the footage followed the, the sound, mostly in the editing. Everything was kind of generated at the same time. Um, and the text was structured based on a, on a religious structure in which there were two peaks. So um, I kind of followed very closely all the different moments and the kind of slow going up, then a kind of moment of reflection and perhaps calming down and then the thing kind of gears up again and then comes down and that's the resolution. And um, when we spoke to Pan, that was also the brief for the music. We were very clear that it had to have these two peaks. We wanted the peaks to be like quite a party situation and that the karma bits will, will be very, very distinct. And then the footage, maybe you want to... Yeah, I think maybe when you talk about a religious ritual specifically, it's, it's a kind of Christian mass, I guess, which has this twofold. Uh, but, but then I think generalized, and I think the reason why we wanted to do that is, is because of to think about these other rituals that, that maybe um, are, are communal and, and create different connections. Um, and I think, the f yeah, the footage sort of followed that, I think, lastly in the editing. Um, it almost came at the end. And to go back then to the, the ritual of dance, um, and there's this beautiful moment in the uh, libretto, in the text, which talks about um, how our perceptions of ourselves vanish when we're dancing without an audience, or when we're dancing without knowing what we look like in the moment of moving. And that leads really beautifully to this idea of um, what, is the, what is the radical other, what is the self, what is the border and the boundary between the two. Um, I have no idea how to formulate that into a question, but <laughs> I think it where, did that, where did that begin? Yeah. I think so, as Gerta said, the, the first conversation we had was with the uh, philosopher Amir Srinivasan, who, who wrote specifically about the octopus and was very generous in thinking with us about uh, consciousness, right? Um, but then at some point we were talking about the octopus and the fact that the octopus can, can display on its skin almost the kind of the megapixel screen of the body, like its skin can, can has chromatophores, which are these small cells that can generate color. Um, mostly for camouflage, but then often, perhaps when it dreams, it goes through these very elaborate sequences. And at the same time, octopuses, octopi, are believed to be colorblind. So what is this communicating to another that cannot, cannot see? And so maybe, and I guess in this conversation, I started to think about this, this moment of dancing for yourself, whether you're alone in a room or whether you're in the middle of a rave that's pitch black and you, d you just kind of lose sense of other bodies. Um, and I think that that was sort of what we were riffing on in some way. So we're speaking so much about the octopus, but actually the octopus is like the one absent figure in the, certainly in the edit of the film. And that was very intentional. It's this yeah. kind of you've described it as a muse in other previous works you've described it as an oracle 
but it doesn't actually ever show up, even though you might think that some images might um, be the octopus. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about the choices of images. Like, what are we looking at yeah. um, when we're looking up to look down? And why looking up to look down, actually? Because it has to do with this connection between the deep sea and outer space as well. So, but anyways, yes, what, what are we actually looking at? Yeah. Um, well, many things. At the moment, you're looking into a human lung being washed with some water. Um, so I guess the beginning of looking up to look down started with looking into how many, how many visuals are actually very similar between kind of space and the sea. There's, um, the sequences, not this one, but there's some sequences of the stars that Tor has made with a, a planetarium software that's making planetarium shows. And then also some footage of coral spawning. And it's just amazing how, how similar these things are. Yeah. It's not until you see the tiny fish crossing exactly. that you're like, oh, yeah. this is not space. <laughs> yeah. I think they're looking up to look down. So I guess the planetarium is looking up to look back because the stars are like, you know, you're looking at million years old. And the looking up to look down is, is the idea that like, if, if the meteorite splashes into the sea and then maybe the, the life comes out of the sea. So it's the kind of the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky. And but there, we, yeah. there are also these two sites that are still relatively, um, unknown to us, both as a space and the very deep sea. There are kind of places where, again, there's a lot of now ambitions to, to reach, to mine, to extract, but actually there's still kind of part of our ecology which is largely untouched and mysterious in some way. So this is a sequence of footage generated by an artificial intelligence, like a style GAN, which is a generative adversarial network, which is a piece of AI which we trained on both the clouds in Juno, which is a moon of Jupiter, as well as, as, well as a coral. Um, and there's another sequence of AI which is trained on virus, images of a virus, but also images of, of meteorite impacts uh, on Mars and on the moon, sort of landing sites, I guess. Um, and so th yeah, the AI kind of imagines like a blend between those. And there's something quite interesting in the way this AI footage moves, which is almost um, reminiscing of the way the pixels on the octopus body kind of shift. So, um, the, so you reminded me, I think yesterday or the day before, that a couple of years ago at the Q&A section of a talk that you did with Felipe Ramos, I asked you why all your work had to do with sex and death. Yes. So I wanted to ask you, to start from sex and death in this work, yes, and to work your way back through sex and death oh God. in your practice, <laughs> <laughs> and the ways in which that sex and that death kind of come to meet and to exist within, particularly this work, through this notion of apophenia, which gives you this like kind of delirious connection-making energy that ends up then being your work. Well. In the many, many, many um, psychology papers I've been reading in the last months around sexual perversion, there was one sentence that really stayed with me, which said, um, it was written by a researcher called Lisa Downing, and she said something like, um, the grumble of death in the heart of sex. That is like, there is no difference. It is kind of the same thing. And I think, the other works, I'm going to leave you to interpret. But in this one, of course, it's very present because, um, I guess, because our muse, the octopus, has a very deadly, super violent and extreme sexual practice. So I kind of just went with it. Um, th I suppose one of the things that emerges in uh, your previous work, which was a huge body of work around gambling, uh, was this question of uh, sort of tracing these lines, these ecologies, between geopolitics, uh, settler colonialist projects, uh, the flow of money, political projects, uh, actual sort of environmental ecologies and so on. Um, and it did that through sort of moving between a casino in Macau funded by one of the biggest conservative political donors and then uh, pieces of work cast in Jerusalem clay and, uh, gosh. Horses. Horses. Horse, uh, yes, the, the sort of very uh, 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 b 
bizarre um, existence of thoroughbred racehorse uh, uh, breeding. And I, and I suppose the question, and, and this work, if there is a piece of this work that addresses these kinds of secret uh, networks and ecologies that might produce capital on one side and uh, oppress a people on the other, the, the place where it shows up here, I think, yes. is in the, all the research that you did around survivalist, hmm. sort of survivalist imaginaries. So a kind of what I think is described as the hyper-rich preparing for an end of the world in which then there's a kind of colonization of Mars, which obviously just repeats the same patterns of colonization of Earth and so on and so forth. And there's this incredible, I mean, it's one of my favorite parts of the libretto. How do we maintain authority over our security forces after? How do we maintain authority over our security forces after? And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this, like survivalism. Absolutely. Um, well, I'll start with with the term you just mentioned, apophenia, which is something that we discovered while doing all the gambling works, but felt like relevant to everything we do, and definitely this work, uh, which is a term that talks about finding a connection between things that maybe seem unrelated. And also when compiling this work, I felt like we were just in this weird place where some things made sense in multiple meanings. And I shared with you my crazy list of things that just kind of kept repeating. So one of these things was the event. And the event can be um, the Cambrian explosion that to discuss. It can be um, the way that the escape artist talks about the moment he enters the water. And it can also be this kind of doomsday event, which nobody knows what it will be yet. So it's discussed as the event. And um, not all space travel plans are centered around it, but some are. They are exactly kind of, I think Elon Musk even says, how do we deal with the event when, when we do the thing, which we don't know what it is yet, we do the thing that destroys this planet, then some of us are just going to go to another planet and start over. So, so I had a conversation with someone who consults with a lot of, he says, oh, I, I, I meet them all the time. And he says, actually, don't worry about it, because it's more like a suicide cult at the end of history. Yeah, and that good. kind of reassured me, because I was like, oh, OK, so I'm not just like missing out on something. Uh, yeah, you're good. I, I'm sort of, uh, we're not all missing out. We just need to look after <laughs> ourselves and each other as um, the suicide cult at the end of history decides to shoot themselves into space, so it's all good. Um, I mean, <laughs> it is funny to mention, you touched upon it, the fact that they're not alike, right? So there's three billionaires racing to space at the moment, um, Elon Musk, uh, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson. And, and so we also spoke at some point to the designers of the space vehicle of uh, Virgin Galactic, i.e. Richard Branson, and their space travels are specifically designed to just be a few days in space and have this kind of overview effect. No, there are three minutes in space. Three minutes. So sorry, yeah, a few <laughs> minutes. But you know, we're not talking about long-term trips, what, which is what Musk and, and, and sort of Bezos are going for. That that's the escape. Whereas Branson, I guess, talks about it at least as um, not to exonerate him, but um, talks about it at least as having this experience and having this overview effect, which you know astronauts have experienced for the very first time that we went beyond our planet. Uh, in order to then kind of realize, well, we shouldn't completely screw this up. I mean, that's kind of what Terence McKenna used to say in the 70s about taking LSD. If we all just took LSD, well, then we would all realize that everything is alive and has consciousness and that we, uh, we exist in a more than human paradigm and not in an anthropocentric one. So it's still it's a just much legit more expensive. argument. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just going to say that that comes full circle so beautifully with. Um, the fact of the octopus as an escape artist, right? Exactly. Um, Apophenia. <laughs> um, and if the if there is no outside, if everything is everything from the molecular to the interplanetary, how do we, beyond accepting that we actually don't have the means or the the bodily functions to exist in space, how do we better look up to look back and accept and 
care for the space that we do have. But it's also there's something, I think especially at this moment, there's something so ridiculous in thinking that we can engineer and plan these things uh, so meticulously and kind of know what will happen where we just saw what happened with the virus and just kind of changed all of our lives completely for the past year. So there's kind of, there's other things in biology and ecology that are way stronger than just kind of metal shooting with lots of gunpowder. I think, yeah, to answer your question also, maybe how, how do we, I think it's about acknowledging the complex interrelationships, right? Which is something that talks about the event or any of these like very singular things. It's not going to be the event. Of course, like, you know, in the kind of interrelationships between our ecosystems, they'll reach a kind of tipping point at some point, which right, like it'll massively accelerate. Um, but it won't be this kind of one singular thing neither like the action that damages it nor the solution. And I think that kind of continuous singular thinking in terms of like how do we fix this, it's gonna be one solution, denies always the complexity of these interrelationships. And, I've, and I kind of feel as if, I, you know, our work doesn't necessarily propose any of these solutions, but it does want to really kind of make you experience and think about it, not just think in a rational way, but also really feel those interrelationships and complexities. Well, yeah, I was going to ask, Lucia touched on this before, about um, this relationship between, let's say, human cultural practices, and there's, there can be, they can be revealed in their absurdity just by shining a light on them in some cases, but also that, that felt uh, impact of observing a set of interrelationships is maybe something that you... Um, focus by drawing on the relationship between the human and the non-human body um, and obviously we've talked about the octopus being the muse but somehow absent vis visibly um, in this work but if you could talk a bit more about how you've kind of drawn out those those relationships between the human and non-human in order to place them in a continuum rather than a, a state of separation in previous works. Yeah. Yeah, so I think one of the examples is the, the thoroughbred racehorse that yeah. Lucia just mentioned. Um, so we, part of the film that it's called, the, it's a film installation which is called The Odds Part One, um, which travels through a few chapters. And one of those chapters is uh, a sort of uh, what they call a knockdown room. It's in, a, in the Newmarket Equine Hospital. So it's where the horses, thoroughbred racehorses, Gets anaest they get anesthetized before surgery. And the, the film really focuses on that moment of collapse, which is, on the one hand, feels quite violent, and on the other, is really full of care because these racehorses are worth millions of pounds. Um, and so, just by looking at that very singular moment, it sort of felt to us like it, it was really related to the body of that particular animal that can only exist within the ecology and economy of gambling, which, which then kind of goes back to the geopolitics behind it, um, you know, and, and, but equally all the cultural practices that this country um, is, is a very specific English practice, right? The thoroughbred is a very imperial um, But also, also, I guess we always, in our work, look at the animal body as a form of sculpture. So I would really consider any kind of breeding as a form of sculpture. So in terms of a thoroughbred is very easy to see because it's so meticulously bred. Um, and maybe in this kind of scenario, which is a lot maybe wilder, the, the act of creation was done by a, the virus. So kind of these directions were given by another entity. But I'm very interested in always looking at animal bodies as things that are created by us in some way or perceived as created by us. No, and I would, I would say that there's a kind of implicit obverse there, which is that we are also created by them. Absolutely. <laughs> that was my thought that I was going to follow. I wanna, uh, there's, some, there's, a, there's like a, a question that I'm struggling to formulate, but I'm just going to just like, throw them a few things. Because I really want to ask you, what is at stake? Like what the political project is in 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 um, 
devoting this work or any of your works in, in the past, but, but maybe specifically this work, to the cosmos, to the entanglement between cosmos, consciousness, escapism, ritual, event, sex, orgasm, whatever. This, this sort of wholeness that the work kind of proposes, or this return to a kind of possibility of a cosmic sense or a cosmic trance. I, this is a question that we absolutely have not rehearsed, so <laughs> if you can just go, I don't know. But like, is there a political project in doing that? Like, what is at stake now? in reconnecting with this infinite complexity and with this kind of non-verbal or perhaps like non, um, uh, uh, you know, like non-restrictive, bridled, unbridled mm. kind of experience of the world or the planet or the interplanetary. I'm, I mean, maybe you two feels different. I would rather not attach a, a kind of um, such a meaning or a political agenda to this. I prefer that it is viewed in a much more open way. I think um, anything that we do, we try to, even if we have very strong political opinions about many things, I try to keep the work to some degree open. So. No, but just by exposing the lines, I mean, in the odds, in the whole gambling project, just by exposing the lines that exist between one thing and another, you are, this is, like, you are part of... Yeah, yeah. yeah but also your is something at stake? World. I'm not sure something is at stake. It's always at stake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think for me, like, on the first, more practical level, for me, is that when we start to think about these interrelationship and this kind of, the complex networks of entanglement, is that the first thing that I realize as an artist or as a practitioner is that I cannot be outside of them. So like that the way I make my work can only be acknowledging that I'm already connected with these things. And therefore, you know, which, which on the one hand feels a bit like, um, sort of like if we're all connected to all, all say the violence and exploitation in the world, <laughs> like we can only hold up our kind of hands and, and apologize for it. No, that's not what it is. It also gives the kind of freedom to to pick up like any small point, right? The racehorse collapsing in the knockdown room and to kind of pick up that little thread and to start kind of wiggling and pulling it around and to realize that it starts moving in Saudi Arabia, in, in Macau and there. And, and the same thing that like, that by acknowledging this kind of entanglement, that it also means that we can't make work as an outsider. Yeah, but you're actually kind of giving this example of the horse collapsing as if it's kind of like, something negative and actually to me the beauty of the work that is as much as it's and it, it feels a bit ridiculous to talk about something that's not here but it's actually a moment of beauty because this horse is getting like just the most wonderful medical care any human or animal can dream of so um i think i just prefer a more kind of i don't know and more I'm open reading you into a corner you yes to be in. okay that's fine so um, uh, the piece says something that was not intended to be of this time, but somehow predicted the future. The virus wants us to be close. They wants us, they want, it wants us to be together. You know it by heart. You can quote it. I can. Better than me. The virus wants us to be together. It wants us close, holding hands, whispering secrets, floating in a galax the galaxy of spit particles. Now I've always thought that like art holds the deep memory about our relationship with the kind of the planet it might also be that it holds a certain kind of prophetic <laughs> is that too much um i wish <laughs> i mean this this little bit of the text was written deep into COVID, so it was i cannot say it was not influenced but it was very very much so but yes i guess the the very beginning of the thinking of like a virus as the source of creation. A virus is maybe kind of the godly part, you know? That was, I remember when the, the coronavirus started, you called me and you were like, oh my God, you know? <laughs> Look what's I'm happening. <laughs> yes. um, so that became really relevant, although it, we could have never known. Like, interestingly enough, Chandra wrote another paper <laughs> um, 
I think, which was published in 2019, but like summer 2019, BC, so like before COVID. But, um, and, and that paper specifically talks about something with magnetic fields of the sun and solar winds, et cetera, et cetera, them being weaker. And so therefore in the coming year, we will have more viruses on this planet. Um, so, I mean, that was really prophetic. Chandra also claims that COVID-19 came from outer space. So many of us have been touched by extraterrestrial. I'm not sure I believe that. We're all touched by the cosmos. Exactly. But I mean, there are, there are things that we already know about ourselves and uh, our physiognomy that come from outer space, right? This, in a way that even the kind of, um, the continuum that we're talking about also exists within what is scientific knowledge and what is currently speculative. I mean, in the sense that there are, you know, atoms and particles that make up the human body in most biological forms that were formed in the Big Bang. Um, and there's a line in the, in the libretto that talks about, you know, the stars being inside your brain, which has to do with visions and orgasms, but also the fact that we're actually we are all made of stars. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just occurred to me that another one of those different states <laughs> is is also that it's like the continuum from uh, sort of I suppose very specific uh, uh, Western scientific knowledge forms that are sanctioned in very specific ways and myriad other ways of sensing, knowing, mm -hmm. in fleshing, embodying, feeling, no, uh, sort of learning, uh, which of which art is one, right? Poetry yeah. is one, myth is one. Ritual is, rituals are many, mm -hmm. and so on. And so that the breakdown of those two things as you experience it, as you're looking up, is, is another one of the, of, the, of the sort of ways in which the work winds its way into a conversation that, we're, a conversation that we need to have right now around kind of mm -hmm. environmental justice and balance. And yeah, I think the politics. stars, <laughs> <laughs> that particular, particular quote, the stars are in your brain, I believe is, are they lang quoting Russell, maybe? Mm -hmm. um, and we arrived at are they lang through Estella Weldon, Wel Weldon the, the psychiatrist we're talking to. Um, and then again, are they lang also talks about different psychiatric states at maybe more like as, as a kind of as a trip, as, as maybe even a kind of, you know, a, we talk about an, an acid trip or other forms of psychedelic experiences. Um, which again was highly controversial, but you know, I think it ties into what you're talking about, the ways like scientific knowledge is formed, that they're also like the product of, of politics, right? And mm -hmm. some things are like, there's a reason why like mm -hmm. all the kind of other consciousness research was shut down in the 70s and like recently got picked up again in the past decade or so. I, I'm conscious about time and I wondered if anyone had any questions, even though we can't, you, we can yeah, hear you. It's actually shout. a little bit disturbing. Yeah, if, if can you we do, have the light? If you do have questions um, and you're willing to just bring them up, um, we will relay them to each other because we want to record them. <laughs> Did you meet any octopuses? I don't think so. I think we actually really tried to avoid that somehow. Um, there was a moment where we were really trying to produce some footage in an octopus tank, um, first in some scientific laboratories, then in, in the aquarium. And every time we were really kind of clear that we only want to do it if there's no real octopus. We don't want to, um, I don't know, octopus in captivity kind of makes me a bit sad. So I was always really interested about kind of human-made um, habitat for octopus and how would they think that could work. But I never wanted to really interrupt the animal. Yes, Daniel?
I'm just going to paraphrase that. That's so um, beautiful, <laughs> I don't know how to yeah. respond. Just, I mean, you talked before about telescopes and early planetarium um, technology. And so the question was about the, maybe not the equivalence, but interest in uh, light traveling through lenses and optics and technology uh, and the time that is implicit, time travel that is implicit in all of those distances and spaces. I think I just really like to look inside things. <laughs> so any... You should have been a surgeon. Possibly. <laughs> so any kind of optic, optical kind of I don't think that can allow me to do that I'm really interested in. So when we've been x-raying the taxidermy, that was like a way of revealing this cultural artifact here by getting this uh, incredibly generous surgeon to give us a bit of his endoscopic footage. It was also, you know, we're thinking so much about breath. Breath was another thing that keeps repeating, both in kind of the suffocation and, of course, the virus and also many forms of meditation and of being together and breathing and the way breath can kind of uh, influence the mind. So there was something in kind of let's look into the lung. And I guess the last one, there's some footage that travels through a diamond. That's like one of the last shots. Because also um, diamond was kind of a recurring theme and there was something in perhaps going through it which made it less obvious, but also quite magical. So that was asking, how did you uh, bring the different references and research paths together? And how did you translate between disciplines? Different and avoid the trap. And avoid the traps. I don't think I've ever avoided the trap of being a human. <laughs> um, but um, I think, well, the way we spoke to these people, we were very lucky. They were very generous. We we just had very long conversations with them that then we would transcribe and spend a lot of time kind of teasing something out of and some cases like mostly Amia I I just kept full quotes by her just her full kind of line of consciousness with Chandra what ended in the libretto was actually two haikus that he's written in the 70s and I thought were really beautiful the astrobiologist um, well, with James, I think, to a really kind of rewritten some things that came up. So I guess we just kind of took all these brains and made some, some kind of salad. And each of them was also perhaps related to our relationship with them and how well we've known each other and how much freedom we felt we can have with their, what they'd given us. And but Brett is outside and printed out if you want to read it all, because probably in the experience of the work, you don't actually perceive no. Not much unless you're looking this way. One thing I did to almost everything is change the word I to we. In almost everybody's word. words. I, I to we. So the question was, how does the work relate to the location? Mm. Yeah, I think, as I mentioned, we, we always wanted to make a film for the, for the ceiling, for looking up, um, which actually we haven't really spoken about, and I, I can talk a little bit more about in terms of one, one of the first, and also someone we didn't mention yet, um, and sorry for, is Edward Bloomer, yep. who is the astronomist at the uh, Greenwich Astronomer. Planetarium, astronom astronomer. Um, astrologist, astronomer, <laughs> um, at the Greenwich Planetarium. And we were talking to him a lot more about what that means. And, and we've made film before we make films. And it was incredibly hard to shift this plane to that because you don't have any kind of off camera that you can cut to. Um, there's no off camera other than the horizon. And so all of that footage needed to work for looking up. 
And so when we were looking for a location, we were looking for a ceiling, um, <laughs> first and foremost. And in some way, when this came up, we already knew that the piece was going to be called Heavens, and we felt that um, maybe it shouldn't be a church, because then maybe that kind of religious dimension became too much. But because this is a Swiss church, it's not a very churchy church. Um, it's quite white. <laughs> and so, and obviously then when we saw like the panels, right, these reflecting things, we, we kind of, or at least I immediately got the sense of like, this is going to work really nicely. Um, it's this, this vaulted ceiling, which is not a planetarium, but does have at least, you know, the curve in one dimension. Um, the piece ended up calling hev being called Heavens halfway through the making of the work. It's true. Why did you call it Heavens? I, I just remember going, yeah, this is amazing, but I don't remember why. I think it was from uh, possibly a quote from the New Testament about um, a comet, about the, the star that fell from the heavens. And again, there's something I like in, in the plural. There is no one heaven, there's many heavens. I think I will have to wrap up, but I'm reminded before I do of a, one of our conversations in which I mentioned to you um, a short story by Asila Le Guin where, from uh, a collection of short stories where the community have, that she's describing, have this practice of um, learning how to feel the earth turning. Um, so they lie out under the stars at night um, and they lie there all night until they are able to perceive that what is moving is not the stars, but the earth. And I think that that is the experience that we want everyone to have in this space, and we would love you all to stay. Um, so we're gonna keep the lights on as we just move some of the equipment around, but the invitation really is to lie down uh, and watch Heavens um, for the rest of the evening. Thank you so much for coming, everyone, and thank, thank you, you so much for Reverend Thank you.